Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love Online. And I just want to share with you God's Word. Be encouraged. Things may not be the way you want them to be, but God, in God's own time, changes will come. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 8 to verse 10. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> what I do want to say to you is there are people that are suffering from, let's say they're suffering from certain things going on in their lives and they're, they're in a quandary and they can't figure out what's really going on. Well, one of the problems with that is, and I'm going to list them, they're dealing with boredom disappointment, aggravation, and annoyance. Not necessarily in that order. But those are the four main things the Lord led me to. And he gave me a dream emphasizing it. Because in each dream, each one of those words, I mean, it was all the same dream, but it was like four little stories in each dream. And each one of those words were in it. So what I want to share with you is there are times, and we're going to start with the word boredom. There are times when you feel like there's nothing happening. Your life is uneventful. You're wondering when, what, how, what is God going to do through you? How is this going to get done? When are you going to get the memo? All of that. But everything you're going through right now is literally preparing you for that day. For such a time as that, I'm not going to say such a time as this, because your this will come when God says it comes, and you will know what your assignment is with clarity. But sometimes what you have to do while you're waiting on God to give you those directions to instruct you in the ways he wants you to go, when you're waiting on God to prepare you for what he wants you to do, it's time to barrel down deep into the word. Fast and pray. Not just pray. Fast and pray. Some answers only come by prayer and fasting. Let me give you a quick example. Years ago when I was, it was 1983. I was saved in 81. September 6, 1981. In 1983, I was starting to have a lot of dreams of holding a mic in my hand and people shouting and I'm wondering, you know, what are they so excited about? I just said this or I just said that. And uh, the thing that I had a, a conversation with my pastor, he said, um, have you had an inclination as to what your calling is yet? And it was really strange the timing because I was starting to have all those dreams. Well, one time... I shared with him some of the dreams that I had had. And he said, you're not getting it, are you? He said, God's trying to show you what your calling is. He said, but since you're having a hard time seeing it, you need to fast as well as pray. Set aside a certain time where you consecrate and let that time be what you use to reach out to God to find out what he wants you to do. So I asked the Lord how, I literally asked God, how many days should I go on a fast? And the number six came to my mind. I said, when should it be over? Saturday popped in my head. So I looked and, and saw, oh, today is so-and-so. Let me count. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, it ends on Saturday if I start tomorrow. So that's what I did. I went on that fast. It was just a liquid fast, soup and liquids. The thing I noticed, the very first scripture I got was Isaiah chapter 6. 
but it wasn't crystal clear enough. It was like using my mouth, but my mouth to do what? So I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. God led me to scripture, 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 whole lot of scripture in Isaiah. So on Saturday, the very last day, he led me to Isaiah 61. Now, I was ignorant to a lot of what was in the Bible because I had only been saved two years and I was not raised in church. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to put you to the test. Somebody gave me this Living Bible, and I love the King James, so the Living Bible was like, how can I say it? The Living Bible had no seasoning to it, whereas the King James was spicy and just the way it expressed itself, I loved it. So I never did use the Living Bible. I took the Bible, I put it in my lap, and I said, Lord, if you give me the page number to Isaiah 61, I'll read it. I never read Isaiah 61. Didn't know what it said. So I'm sitting there and I waited for about five to seven minutes, actually. And all of a sudden I saw 575. And I turned to page 575 in the Living Bible. And there was Isaiah 61 sitting smack dab in the middle of it. Then I read it. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach. And that's what I wanted God to give me, the specific anointing that was on me. What is my divine call? I know you've gifted me with about 10 or 15 abilities, but I need to know what is my divine call. And I wanted this specific word to describe it. And that was it, to preach the gospel to the poor or to the meek. All right. So the bottom line is when you're seeking God, there are times when you feel useless. You feel like you're floating up in the air. I used to tell the Lord, I feel like I'm in a holding pattern here, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not accomplishing anything. I'm not doing anything. What do you want me to do? And once you know that you know that you know what God's divine calling is on your life, you have more of a sense of purpose and you begin to prepare and equip yourself as you go. Because now you know what to zero in on. And that begins to remove the boredom from your life. It's a beautiful remedy that the Lord creates in us. And purpose is a great remedy for boredom. Amen? All right. Now we're going to go to the next word, which is disappointment. Mm. Many of you suffer from disappointment. Now I'm going to share this dream on that one. In the dream, I was, I'm not going to go into detail. It was just something I wanted. I was able to get my hands on it. And as soon as I got my hands on it, I found out somebody else got, somebody else got their hands on it and devoured it. And I was so disappointed. I was so disgusted. That thing made me so angry. The next thing that happened was I had a radio and I finally got the cord and I was trying to get it working so I could do some recording. And someone snatched it and went outside and then some kid had the cord. And I'm thinking, they're gonna mess up my radio. Oh, I was so upset. Well, what God was showing me in that is that there are many of you, he gives me dreams where I'm actually other people going through different stuff that I'm not really going through. There are many of you that want things to turn out a certain way in your life. And it's not turning out that way. Why? Because we have the element of change, the element of surprise. And people will do things that you did not put on your itinerary. You did not program that to happen. And you did not plan for it. And it's something you really don't welcome. It's very, very frustrating when people take it on themselves to change your plans. But they don't know it, but you do. Well, there are times when you have to literally ask God to give you 
more flexibility. Because when you find yourself being upset by the changes people bring into your life, the changes of schedule, they change your your plans, they're changing direction. You want to go this way, they take it that way. And you're you're frustrated, you're disappointed, you're oh you don't know what to do. How do you handle these people? They're they're messing up your plans. They're making changes that you did not put in your schedule. You didn't send out a memo saying we're going to go instead of ABC, we're going to do CDE. No. See, the thing that's hard about that is you have to ask God at times, Lord, am I becoming rigid? Because when you're inflexible, when you're rigid, when you have a closed mind, when, you, when you're very methodical and you do the same thing the same way all the time, you, you get involved with other people who are flexible, who are spontaneous. And sometimes those people will drive you crazy because you are rigid. It doesn't mean they're doing anything wrong. The thing to do at that point is ask God to recondition you so that you can be more flexible. You can be more pliable. Everything doesn't have to be your way or the highway. Hmm? Think about that. Life doesn't have to be that hard because it's only hard like that because of the way you see it, your perspective of life can be very, very narrow. Some people call it being narrow-minded. Some people call it being fixated. Some people call it being rigid. Be careful with that because you can create a very difficult life for yourself if you're not asking God to broaden your scopes, broaden your horizons, soften your heart, make it easier for you to change directions without feeling like it is the end of the world. <laughs> All right. The next thing we have to be careful about is being so easily annoyed. <laughs> Sometimes we can be so easily annoyed that we, are, we find ourselves being aggravated. And I'm going to read Romans chapter 7 on that one. I want you to hear how exactly what the quandary is here. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7 shows how a person can have the can't help it. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about sin on this. I'm talking about being stuck. And many of us in life, find ourselves being stuck. And I'm going to share with you how, because God gave me an analogy. This is going to be a short message, I think. All right, here we go. <clears throat> We're going to start, this is Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the Lord that it is good. Now, then is it no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me? But I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. Now, what I want to share with you, it, the Lord sh showed me an, uh, an image when I was sitting in the living room preparing for this message. And one of the things that, this is comical how we go through life. Picture having a magnifying glass in your hand. All right. And the magnifying glass, you're looking at something. And you want a bigger image of it because you want to focus in on it a little better. You want to see more detail. So you get a magnifying glass. Now, when you're looking at the image, you're focused here, right? 
But picture this, your peripheral vision can pick up what's happening around the room. But your focus is through the magnifying glass. Well, this is what we do with our problems, with our challenges. Picture it now. And this is what we do with our past. We zero in on the image that frustrates us, that annoys us, that gets on our last nerve. And we're so focused in on this thing that we can't enjoy the view of the big picture because we're focused in on this. So our peripheral vision is blurred. We don't see the roses. We don't see the sun shining through the silver lining of the clouds. We don't see the leaves of the trees and the wind blowing. We don't see any of that. We don't see the birds flying and tweeting in the branches. We don't see that. We're focused in on this problem. The other thing the Lord showed me that's really hard for some of you, that's also annoying, is some of you focus on life through a zoom lens. When you zoom in, then I'm going to do that with this camera outside to make an example. Look at how ugly that is. Ugh. As the kids say, ew. But focus out. Wait a minute. Change your focus. Let's get your mind off the problem. And let's raise your head. Ask the Lord to be the lifter up of your head. And you will find as you open your eyes and you look up, you're like, oh my goodness. <gasps> Oh my goodness, what a beautiful day. Look how pretty it is today. Wow, look at the trees. Oh my God, it's just such a gorgeous day. Oh, look what I would have been missing out on. This is my life. Oh, my life is beautiful. Look all around me. Oh my goodness, how gorgeous. Let's lean over here and see what's down the way. Oh, look what God has prepared ahead of me. Oh, this is beautiful, but, but, but there's that problem. And this thing just, just bugs me and I just can't get my mind off of it. Oh no, here I go again. Focuses, focusing on the problem. What am I going to do? Oh no. Lift your head up high. Look up to the hills from whence cometh my help, right? My help comes from the Lord. So guess what? I have a goodly heritage. I'm blessed. I'm too blessed to be stressed, y'all. Look at this. Oh, no. No, I don't have time to worry about those little problems. That is too small. Look how small that is. When you look at the scheme of things, I can't even see it now. Oh, thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day. When you zoom in, the zoom lens brings the image that's far away like years ago when i i did a, a video of a bird tweeting in a, in a in a branch and the branch was like a block away from me but when i zoomed in on it that brought that bird so so close that he took up two-thirds of the frame now when i zoomed in on that bird guess what all the houses, the roofs, the trees, the scenery, all the greenery and the beautiful clouds in the sky. I couldn't see any of that. I saw the bird with a few leaves behind it. That was it. What happens with many of us is when we use the zoom lens, this is all the lenses of the flesh, those lenses that lean to our own understanding, looking at life through our own perspective. We get frustrated because all we see is that little that that little crow sitting on the branch. We don't see the beautiful tree. We don't see the sky, the beautiful blue sky behind it. We don't see the beautiful scenery all around it. No, we don't see the whole community. We don't see any of that. We see that black crow sitting on that tree branch. That's all we see. Because we're zoomed in on the problem, it's the problem. And we're pointing at the problem as we describe the problem and we focus in on that problem. Guess what? We get more and more upset. We get more and more annoyed. That problem, if it wasn't for that problem, 
<laughs> Dad, nabbit! And we don't realize we're upsetting ourselves. We're getting ourselves all bent out of shape because of something that's really not that big and something that's not in our immediate vicinity. But even though it's a distance away, whether in the future, in our present, or in the past, it's not in our immediate circle right now. But we're so busy focusing on that, we can't enjoy what's happening right in front of us. We can't enjoy the, the lawns and the greenery and the beautiful chimes and the trees. And, and We can't enjoy any of it because we're looking at that thing down the road through a zoom lens and we have blown that thing so far out of proportion that we can't enjoy life you ever hear the expression can't see the forest for the trees yeah we zoomed in too much zoom out baby ask god to give you a different lens because see if God enables you to look at your issues, if God enables you to look at your problems, he's not doing it to get you upset. He's doing it to help you reconcile the issues, understand what's going on, and he will give you a solution if you ask. He will. He always makes a way of escape. You hear what I'm saying? So when God gives you a lens, you know what he's going to give you? And this is the part we don't like to use because it shows us way too much. You know how the kids say, TMI, TMI, too much information, baby. Don't want it. But God will give you TMI. He will zoom that baby in on a microscope. That's what God's going to have you look at. And when you look at the microscope, you're going to understand the structural makeup because you're going to see the cells, the atoms, all the little intricacies that make that problem what it is. And God will shine light. He will illumine what's going on and give you understanding. And with the understanding, he will give you wisdom to know how to correct the issue. He will give you wisdom so you will understand how to fix the problem and come up with a perfect solution because the wisdom comes from God. The illumination comes from God. The magnification comes from God. And so will your understanding. And you have a much clearer view of what the real problem is. The real problem could possibly, possibly be you. Mm-hmm. The real problem could possibly just maybe be your pride. It could be your arrogance. It could be a, a level of rebellion that's in you. It could be denial. Oh, no, denial. Yeah, thing called self-denial. Yeah, but you're not denying yourself. You're denying what God's showing you about yourself. Mm-hmm. You're turning a blind eye. Very, 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 very common occurrence in the human race. Denial. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask God to show you the truth about yourself. Because one thing we forget, God knows you and God knows me better than we know ourselves. Trust me on that one. The fourth problem that we have in life is aggravation. We get aggravated, baby. You see, we forget the scripture that says tribulation works patience. Patience, experience. And experience, that works hope. And hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Well, see, love covers a multitude of sin. So where there's love, there's no need for shame. There's no need for condemnation. There's no need for any of that. And one of the things we find is we come real short of patience when it comes to other people and how they frustrate us. And we get downright aggravated. Dealing with folks 
if the world just didn't have people, I'd be all right. Uh, it's got you, baby, so it ain't all right. It's, a, it's We don't realize how people get on our nerves for some very simple reasons. Our love tank is run very low. Our focus on the problems and the issues and on ourselves because we are lovers of selves more than lovers of God. A lot of times we don't realize that's another issue and that's the cause of aggravation because we love ourselves more than anybody else. We love ourselves more than we love God, more than we love his ways. So is my way or the highway. And if you don't do that my way, it's going to aggravate me. If, if, if what you do doesn't make sense to me, you're going to get on my last nerves. No, I'm sorry. I can't handle that. I cannot handle this person. I'm sorry. This is so stupid. And we don't realize how we talk to people that way. I didn't tell you to do that. I told you to do it that way. Now just go on and get it done. Just, just get out of my face and get it done. And we find ourselves, I don't know if the word is berating, but, but we, we land blast. We, we, ah, we literally disrespect people. We strip them of their dignity because they have the unmitigated goal to get on my nerves. How dare they? Do they know who I am? We don't realize that we do that. And that's why we get aggravated. Not always because someone else is doing something wrong. But see, some of us, we have color issues. And what I'm talking about, the way we look at light, some people like the color green. Some people like the color red. Red is my favorite color. But that does not negate the fact that green is also pretty. That turquoise and purple and pink, all of those are pretty. But my favorite color is red. So if you don't come at me with red, you're not worthy of my attention? Really? All right now. All righty. Yeah. And that's a lot of times the way we approach life, relationships, and personal interactions on our jobs, at our churches, our workplace, on the field, whatever. We deal with people that way. They don't come my way. They don't dress my way. They don't speak my way. They don't have the class that I think I'm worthy of. They're not worthy of my time. Mm -hmm. And we look down on people. So they aggravate us so easily. They get on that reserve nerve because of their imperfections. How can you be so imperfect? How can you be so stupid? You're stuck on stupid. What's wrong with you? No, you need to ask, Lord, what's wrong with me? Why am I so intolerant? Why am I so impatient? You show me patience all the time. You're Kadistu holy, which means without defect. I'm full of defect, but I can't stand someone else's defect. Something wrong with that that's defective. Pardon me for being so redundant. I'm doing it for effect. Defect. <laughs> All right. So let's ask God mm -hmm, to show us ourselves so that we're not so quick to focus and zero in on their problem, on their stupidity, on their limits, how many things they get wrong. Did they, I didn't tell you to do it like that. Well, they're an individual. Maybe they don't think the way you do. Maybe they actually have another approach that could be more effective than yours. Did you think of that? That's why some of you micromanage and you drive your employees crazy because you want everybody to clone you. Who made you the authority? The only authority in this world is God, baby. Not you. Your name is not J-E-S-U-S. -S. Your name is not Y-A-W-E-H. You are not Yahweh. You are not Elohim. You are not the great I am, baby. No, you may be caught up on me, myself, and I, but you are not the great I am. So back up from being so impatient with other people with other people's methods and ways. 
Back up from being that person that you have turned out to be. Let's stop being so snobbish and intolerant. Let's stop being so impatient, so critical. Let's stop being disrespectful, shall we? And let's ask God to teach us what real love is. Amen? And I'm closing with that scripture. We are going to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because I want you to see what real love is. I love this. It really... Anyway, let me read it. They call this the love chapter. Some of you think you got all the gifts in the world. You got abilities that beat the band, baby. But this says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. In case those of you may not know, charity means love. So if you don't have love, it says, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, which means it equates to the the acronym, um, not the acronym, what's the word? The colloquialism or the colloquial phrase, empty cans make a lot of noise. And some of you are empty and void of love. And you just, you rattle everybody's cages. You just make a lot of noise. You make a lot of hoopla and high blue and whatever you want to call it over someone else's differences. They're different from you. Oh, they're going to hear about it, baby, because you're going to tell, you're going to have them told. I become a sounding grass or a tinkling cymbal, nothing but noise. Number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, charity, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. You spell that K-I-N-D. Kind. Charity envieth not. It's not jealous. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Oh, hey, baby, it is me. Doth not behave itself unseemly. So watch how you talk to folks. Seeketh not her own. In other words, everything doesn't have to be my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. Is not easily provoked. What you say? You better back up. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Is not suspicious. I know what you're doing. I know what you meant. I know what you Yeah, you think I didn't see that? I know what you up to. You ain't about nothing. I'm going to tell you thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Verse 7, beareth all things, believeth all things. People believe in people when they love them. Hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now I'm going to drop down to the bottom line. Verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. And let me repeat in everyday terms. And now abides faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. God bless you.